Bonsoir to those of you who have just joined. I see that there are many more who have just um, connected to our event tonight. And so we have the pleasure tonight to host uh, Linda Jane Holden, Thomas Lloyd, and Brian Hoffman for a talk centered on their recently released book, Garden Secrets of Bonnie Mellon. All of the authors have personally known Rachel Bonnie Mellon, and uh, we are honored to be able to listen about, uh, to learn about her life and work through people who knew her so closely. So this is really precious and I think we are all appreciating it tonight. So now we'd like to share some more information about each speaker uh, before they let us step inside Bunny Mellon's glorious gardens and tell the story of her life and um, of their book. So uh, Linda Jane Holden uh, worked in the Reagan White House where she could see the historic gardens and grounds and talk with the gardeners every day and forge unique friendships. So this perspective, along with an appreciation for the White House history, led to the writing of The Gardens of Bunny Mellon, an illustrated biography, which uh, she published in 2018 and which is now in its third printing. Linda is a former educator and she's currently living in Virginia to be near her three children and four grandkids. Brian Hoffman met Bunny Mellon in the fall of 2004 through her church, Trinity Episcopal in Upperville, Virginia. He was highly influenced by the beauty and simplicity that she created there and a friendship was forged. As Bunny wrote to him, I created a church and God sent a sympathetic friend like you down the road when I needed it the most. Their daily communications by phone and post uh, gave him keen insight into her innermost thoughts and vision and obviously allowed him to contribute so much to this book we're discussing and presenting tonight. Brian currently works as a residential designer. Thomas Lloyd is the grandson of the late Rachel Bunny Mellon. Thomas was appointed president of the Gerard B. Lambert Foundation in 2017, a nonprofit which supports charitable and educational organizations seeking to improve well being through the compilation of horticulture, conservation, sustainability, and the arts, and which was also central in the development of the Oak Spring Garden Library and its contents. From a young age, uh, having been greatly influenced by his grandmother, Thomas has acquired a firm appreciation for the historical aspects of landscape architecture and design. And in 2017, he was elevated to the board of directors of the Institute of Classical Architecture and uh, Art. Thank you, Natasha. And uh, hello to everyone out there. Good evening. If you are uh, on the East Coast or wherever you may be, it's a pleasure to be here tonight and to share with you our story about this book. Um, just very briefly, I'll bring up um, slides here. Um, the story of my grandmother is in a lot of ways two parts. It's the public side of her that many people are, are, are aware of. She was a philanthropist. She was a icon of, of, of many uh, levels uh, for, for people uh, in, in, for art and style. She developed so many things for uh, the Kennedys over the years that um, but really, at the end of the day, what many people wanted to understand was what was really at her core. And really, at the end of the day, I didn't know her that well, as crazy as that sounds. We were not close. Um, so this project was in a large part a part of me wanting to see if I could get to know her after she passed away. Um, I think um, it, it's important to, um, sorry, I just want to make sure. Yeah, there we go. Okay. We un Okay, we're on there, sorry. Um, that, um, that my grandmother ostensibly was who she was because she loved gardening. It was her, in her core, her, her, her spirit. It was everything about how she lived and viewed her life. And through that prism, it's very important to understand how one can truly really understand her emotions and how she grew to become the person she was through this, this world of, of her gardens, which were amazing and lovely um, on so many levels. Um, so, um, you know, with that, really, I wanted to sort of give an idea of how she developed this. Um, it came from a very young age. Um, she was very interested from her youngest years in Albemarle in Princeton, New Jersey at her father's house of developing skills. She watched, she learned, she was self-taught. And over the years, she acquired many, many, many skills through books and literature that were really in a large part based around French gardening. 
um, her friend Hubert de Givenchy, who you see here in the picture. She and him developed a very strong relationship and a very strong friendship. And it was through that as well that she became very much um, aligned with the French style of gardening. And that anchored in a large part how she learned and taught and developed her garden spaces and her architecture that surrounded those. But for the purposes of tonight, I think we're really gonna focus on her gardening and her tips, which is what we really wanted to do with this book. So with that, I will hand it over to Linda. Linda, why don't you take it from here? Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanna say that just like Mrs. Mellon said about Brian, having Brian come along after she had built a church and I feel the same way about Thomas and uh, Brian coming along and in my life, it's been a real joy to work together, a lot of fun. It's a lot more fun to work on projects together than separately. And I think that's one reason that Bunny and Hubert enjoyed each other so much. They worked on many projects together. They shared a profound admiration for horticulture, the horticultural traditions of their own countries and each other's. She in the US and he in France. Um, they work together to enhance the beauty of the architecture through the sight lines as they enhance the vistas uh, beyond the property boundaries. In this picture here, she's wearing her French beret, and which was a favorite, and she's sitting in a meadow of blue scylla that she planted, and as you know, just self-propagated and every season became bluer and bluer. And she and uh, Mr. Givenchy also planted the blue scylla at his country home, Les Granchers, outside of Paris. Uh, you know, they're both very sentimental artists and he had a very large tree that cast a big shadow in the summertime. And they drew the outline of the tree and then filled it in with this blue scylla. So that when the scylla came up the next year, it was a memory of the, the time before. She did that same kind of idea in her own garden at Oak Spring uh, with butterflies. This is Jean-Baptiste de la Cantine, and he was the, the vegetable gardener to King Louis the 14th. And he is the one who established the Potage du Roi uh, there in Versailles. Uh, when I first started going to Mrs. Mellon's library, I was enchanted with some pictures, well, there are many pictures on the wall, but there was one of this garden and her there with the gardeners. And that just instilled in me over the years, a keen desire to go there one day. At the time it was like a dream. I didn't even imagine I could ever go, but I did get there and it opened up a whole new world to me, learning about Cantine and what had uh, gone on there, okay? So this is a statue that's there in the garden in Versailles, up on the upper terrace. And here's the garden. And this is the central basin. Now, Givenchy became president of the World Monuments Fund in 1990 when he sold his house of Givenchy. And at the top of the World Monuments watch list was the restoration of the Padre de Roi. And they had a hard time deciding where to actually begin, uh, the two of them. And they studied and traveled and decided that they would restore the main features first, which is this central basin here. And it does have a fountain that uh, is not uh, flowing right now in this picture, which is kind of good. You can see, uh, see things better. So uh, Givenchy shared a story about this with me when I first met him. He said that uh, he and Bunny had talked about it and Bunny called him one day and said, Paul and I were having cocktails last night and I explained to him how you wanted to restore the, the protege and that the basin really needed to be restored. And it's also the central waterworks or the irrigation system. So it's really crucial. And she said, so we, we talked and uh, decided that we would just, um, he, I asked him how much money did he want to contribute and, he's, and he said, why don't we just pay for the whole thing? So she told Givenchy that they would just pay for the whole thing. And he said, you know, expressed his gratitude and then said, well, uh, we need to put a plaque somewhere to, to uh, commemorate this. And she said, oh, no, no, we, we, we don't want anything. We, 
not at all. We don't want any attention whatsoever. And he said, no, Bunny, I have to put something there or people are going to wonder where the money came from. And he said he didn't want to go to jail. So she agreed that uh, she didn't want him to go to jail either. And they agreed that they, they, he could put a small plaque. It's very small and unobtrusive. And it's on this little wall here. And it's there today. Um, but when you enter this garden, uh, like when I first went, I expected to see names of Mel the name Melon and Bunny Melon. It's nowhere in sight. You have to really look for it. You had no idea that she was involved here. These are these spaliers <clears throat> that she loved. The first time she went into the garden was a misty fall afternoon. And she was just mesmerized by the atmosphere and these rows upon rows of fruit trees that were pruned and clipped just so. She was entranced. She'd already been trying to teach herself. You know, she was a self-taught gardener. Uh, so she's been trying to to learn herself and so when she walked into this it was like you know a, a dream come true for her as it had been for me and she eventually got to know the gardeners there and they began to teach her how to prune she studied the what she called her their bible the Cantonese, uh the complete gardener the manual that was published by his son after his death uh when he died when Cantonese died louis the 14th came to his wife and said Madame, we have both lost a very important person to us. And I, you know, to him, he was the gardener to her. He was her husband, but Louis the Fourteenth was grief stricken at the loss of Fontenay because he had created this whole garden for him. And ultimately it was to provide health, wellness, well-being because it fed the court. It was where all the fruit and vegetables came from that fed the enormous court that was there at Versailles. Is there, you can go to the next picture. Here's another beautiful, beautiful picture of these espaliers that she loved. And you can see how there's different ways, different designs and different formats where they can be uh, uh, organized, the, the rows and the branches, how they're separated. Some are freestanding, some are uh, done against a wall, others against fencing. It's a lot of uh, opportunity to be creative with this method of gardening. It's also a, a space saver. If you want to try it, it's a great thing to do. Even if you have a little space, you can find a, a spot and, and try it, even in a pot on your porch. Okay. <clears throat> this is a candelabra form of the espalier. And I, I think it's just uh, exquisite. Uh, this, you could frame this picture and hang it on the wall. It's just so beautiful. And you can see how every branch, if you look closely, has its own space and everything is pruned. Every little blossom, every twig is treated separately uh, and has its own, like I said, its own space. She also used uh, leather, strips of leather cowhide to fasten it because it didn't rot through. Here's another variation showing the cathedral there in Versailles in the background more the freestanding uh, espalier. And it, it would be lots of different fruit, um, apples, pears, and peaches. Um, Louis loved figs. This is a, now we're gonna hop over to Jean Chez, which is Hubert de Givenchy's country house. And this is the view from the back of the house to the Ag River. And he, uh, with Mrs. Mellon, they worked together to create this tapestry of texture. And it's a lawn, but they are squares of boxwood with uh, circles uh, of in, within the rectangles, concentric circles that flow inside of each uh, rectangle. He got the idea from the Benedictine Monastery in Venice, and he loved it so much, but he was such a man of integrity. He went there and asked their permission if he could copy their design at his home. They, of course, told him that he could. Um, but you could see how, how meticulous the pruning was done on, on these little hedges. A lot of time consuming work, a lot of gardeners. <laughs> and let me just step in real quick because I think one point, Linda, that you um, ex extended, but I really want to make sure people understand about my grandmother that I learned through this process was 
she really, really believed in space. I mean, she really wanted to make sure that every single branch, every tree, every hedge had its own space, not only existing, but where it could grow. So that really sort of juxtapositions to what you see in today's world. A lot of times you'll see very cramped, um, you know, tightly uh, wound uh, trees with bushes. Uh, that was something that my grandmother never liked at all. And I think in a large part, you'll see that trend continue through a lot of these. So I just wanted to point that out. Linda. You can well, I'm glad you did. And I love that um, rather than just, just talking, because it's hard to talk to an audience you can't see. You know, so, um, but this view points out their desire, the way they would open up the vista. So imagine you're in the house and you're looking out the back uh, upstairs window or the back door, back gate. This is, they opened it up and it goes past the, the river into the bordering uh, beyond the, uh, the property boundaries. So they extend the vista. And so they integrated the sight lines. And so this is part of what her use of space, she capitalized on it by opening things up. And so you know that this was done with intent. And if you look closely around the edge of the lake, you'll see a wattle fence. Uh, Jean Che means reed. And so they collected the little branches and things and wove them around as like a, a border, like on a skirt um, around the edges of the lake. But that is exactly what that is. That's the vista from the house um, is where this, the view originates. <clears throat> this is another uh, view uh, to the side of what we just saw. And you can see once again, the horizon, how this has more of a, uh, it is open, but yet the forest was left in, in, intact. Uh, this is a view, an aerial view of Oak Spring, uh, which was Paul and Bunny Mellon's home in Upperville, Virginia. And it, it is, if looking straight to the back is the east, uh, to the left, and then the west, um, straight back is to, is to the south. And so you can see, uh, it looks very much, maybe remind you of your travels through France of a French village, a little hamlet, as all of the buildings seem to um, roll into one after the other. Over to the left, down below, you'll see a green structure, and that is the, uh, the arbor that she built that, is, that connects the garden to her former greenhouse. And then she had roads that, you know, swished all around. They were dirt country roads that she preferred. And um, to the right, the bottom corner is a basket house. It's, it's a little octagonal building with a little window. And that is the basket house. And you see a little pool in the front. And it was built as a replica of the basket factory she had visited with her grandfather as a child when she spent her summers with him. And it was a basket house in North Ringe, uh, New Hampshire, that they would visit on their when they arrived in town on the weekends. And the house had a stream of water in front of it, and then two boards were placed over the stream that they had to walk across to enter the basket factory. So what she's done here is rebuilt a, a piece of her childhood. And um, even the the bridge is there; it's a sliver of a bridge. And there's two pools of water, what's actually one pool that evokes the memory of that stream. She even had little jets put in to ripple the water so that it moves just like a stream would and then a lit where it flows over. So you get this sensation of moving water just like she had at that stream. And then of course the basket, her basket house was hung with baskets just like she saw in the basket factory. I love this picture because in the uh, foreground here is a little spring house. And this spring house is probably the first structure on this property. It's a hundred years of years old and there used to be a log home up top that the Mellons did roll across the street uh, went to make way for their home. But Mrs. Mellon always looked for inspiration in her design. And here at Oak Spring, it seems that this little spring house provided the exact inspiration she needed in organizing her thoughts uh, for her design for her house and garden. She always thought of gardening um, and designing as a way of thinking. And so thinking was really important to her, hence her love of books and literature and collecting books for her library. 
it helped to establish the base of, basis of her thought. So you can see this little stone uh, spring house became amplified up at the main house. Um, same roof lines and stone. It's just enchanting. Mm. I love this picture here. Do you want to talk about this, Brian? Well, just to say how Bunny loved everything with, as the famous line of nothing should be noticed. And if this doesn't embody that, I don't know what does. As it's going around, you've seen the uh, back of the house and this is going around by the basket house. Just a two uh, pronged road, so to speak with packed uh, dirt and a little gravel with the grasses growing up between. So it's just really so emblematic of what I would say would be the true art of her style. And, and, well, and you can notice the way she pruned the trees, it, very uniform, but it had a soft flowing look. This is the, uh, an espalier there at Oak Spring. You can see the stone wall that I was just talking about that it's pruned against. And it's that same form that she practiced in Versailles in France. You might tell them, oh, I was just going to say, if you go back to any of that, how Bunny always talked about people being amazed by her handshake and it was for pruning. <laughs> <laughs> strong, a strong one, right? Strong, strong. People were amazed by her grip. Well, and also another part of this that was an experience for me as I began to help update some of the garden spaces uh, in the later years when uh, my grandmother was not able to get out and prune as much, the element of less is more where she is really letting the natural world show through. And if we go back and uh, look at this slide uh, two before with the road, this takes tremendous effort to keep up and look. So it looks simple. It looks very natural, but it is extremely hard to do. And I just think that, uh, again, one of the things my grandmother did was made something look so simple. But behind that, she was so articulate and specific with exactly what needed to happen. As a person who just learns a lot of this um, through this process, it is amazing the amount of work that goes into keeping this look untouched or, you know, not manicured. Part of her style. <laughs> Part of her style, right. We have another next picture. Do we look at this one already? This is a guest house. Now we've moved along to the Cape, I guess. Well, I'll t this is one of, I, I think this is a terrace. This is the terrace on the upper level, upper terrace at Oak Spring. And notice how the flea bane daisies in the common time are creeping up through the cracks in the stone. The, when the stonemason laid this terrace, well, it was quarried from a nearby Warrington and then brought to the farm and rolled down the lane uh, to get the stone there. And then he started laying it east to west and she came out and she said, oh, I really want it to go north to south. So we had to pick it up and switch it and then uh, and then one day, one of the cornered pieces broke off and he went and got another slab of stone and he was going to replace it. She came running out and said, oh, no, no, leave that there. And he's like, well, I'm sorry, I cracked it. I, and I need to get one that's not cracked. And she said, oh, no, just leave it as is. And then she proceeded to take the ha hammer out of her pocket. And she went around to some of the other corners and chipped them away too. And then to his disbelief, he said, I had gone to all this trouble to get all the corners just straight. And she starts banging away. And then she took out her seeds and started sprinkling seeds in the cracks and, and then left them. She wanted them to grow. And that's what you, that's what gives this lovely, lovely soft look. And I think that's the underlying fundamental part of her style, her garden style. True. Well, what, what, one other thing, Brian, do you want to comment on her use of shadows and light uh, as a huge part of the influence and perspective? Well, it, I designing? mean, it's when, when uh, Linda was talking about the tree uh, that Givenchy had when you were back with the Scylla and where the shadow was cast, they planted the Scylla along the entire shadow of the tree. So even if the shadow, if the sun were not uh, in that certain spot, 
they could look out and share the shadow that would be at a certain time of day, but they could have it. I mean, it's just truly romantic and incredibly artistic to be able to have that vision and create this is just magical. And look at this with the basket, the shadow, the long uh, light of things coming through. Her artistry is evident in everything she did. And the craftsmanship in that evident in that basket. Brian, you want to talk about that, the bench and the tree? Well, I mean, this is at Oak Spring, just to what one thing that is interesting, one of my first conversations with Bunny, she said she had always wanted to be a stage designer and her father would not allow her because it wasn't done. She had to select a proper young man and get married and could not have a career. And she said, Brian, ever since then, I've spent my life setting a stage wherever I go. And I think this picture to me is so emblematic of a tableau that she created and took this photo with the whiteness of the bench and then the a typical bunny tree, if you uh, go to Oak Spring or any of her properties, all the trees in the surrounding places are all kind of haphazard as trees may be. And then you get to the melon part of the world and all the trees are shaped and they're just like a fairy tale world. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. This is at Oak Spring. This is a, a border along the square garden. And you can see the same technique coming where she liked to let plants roam a bit and kind of hover in place and that softened the edges and you got to step around. And even if you stepped on them, of course they would release the scent and that just adds to the beauty to the left of the apple cordons that um, were kept just so high, like a little, you know, a hedge that bordered the walkways in, in the garden. It must've been a wonderful as a child, Thomas, to run through these gardens. Uh, yes, of course, you couldn't touch any of it. So it was sort of a look, don't touch thing, which as a any child or boy, especially under the age of 10, that's that's pretty impossible to do. I, I will actually say, I do recall one of her, uh, as, as Linda mentioned, she uh, really uh, was so uh, interested in, in a variety of fruit trees, but especially apple trees. So on her property in Oak Spring, she has a line of beautiful, beautiful, apple trees of a variety of, of, of different varieties and I remember as a child going through trying to find a perfect basket and then going and picking a few and then realizing that some tasted better than others and she actually was very helpful because when I brought back a, a bunch of them she told me which ones were good for cooking which ones were actually good to eat and I figured that out pretty clearly but you could never pick enough. There were just so many of them. And so the abundance of it, I think, was just amazing to me as a child. Uh, but her gardens were very, very, very much, uh, again, with the borders, um, just a, a work of art. And I think I, I really have to emphasize this because it's something I didn't appreciate until much later in my life, this idea of letting things free flow. Um, also, I think really reflects how my grandmother never ever felt a garden needed to stay a certain way or a specific way. And it doesn't mean the alter the entire format. What it does mean is that if a tree needs to be changed, you change the tree. If you need to move something, you move it. But at the end of the day, it's about adapting and updating. And she loved working almost like a, a, a canvas that would completely change every month uh, within those confines of knowing that she would change something. And there was never a moment where she never felt that it was perfect, ever. So anyone who really feels very much like they have a garden that will release a certain sort of part where they'll feel that that's it um, would not work well with my grandmother. <laughs> yeah, she <laughs> never liked done. It. So. This is uh, on the middle terrace of Oak Spring Garden. It's, there are two butterflies, butterflies. And it's the same thing as the blue scylla, the tree that she and uh, uh, Givenchy did. You can see the outline of a butterfly and it's planted here with flowers of the season. 
that, of course, you would, you know, circle through. Uh, uh, even like Givenchy said, he treated each new garden season as for something new, the same way he treated one of his couture lines. He always had a new line and he had new ideas in his garden, always building on the traditions of what was there, but tweaking and adding uh, as he went along. And the same thing here is uh, these butterflies. She loved butterflies and she had them in, in the house too, right guys? On, yeah. some of the, on the, the fabrics. fabrics. <laughs> on the fabrics, yeah. 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 So new life is important, uh, growing some, uh, and so, and there's a little fountain in this picture. And I just want to remind everybody that these are her pictures. Yes. A lot of these pictures are pictures that she it took. Yeah, and that uh, the words, the book is written from her own journals and, and includes her own photography. So it's like having her own little workbook uh, with you. Or her is what it photo is. album, you know, something that she would create for herself to to see and do. And so I think that's what makes this so magical. Mm. This is the, uh, the wedding cake gazebo. Do you want to describe that, Thomas? Well, I mean, the symmetry here is amazing to me. I think there was such a balance that she had in being able to um, have the structures, as you see in the background, the reflecting pool that had her very signature bunny blue that she painted all of her pools the same color. It was this very unique blue that, of course, only she could create. And um, the idea also of seeing the just free flowing um, nature of of the cracks uh, in the in the in the in the stone here, and and that how it balances so well with the shape of of the table. I think, and again, this is all very intentional uh, for her to, to to have these grow a certain length and to be positioned where they were. So uh, it is a very elegant, simple look that is extremely um, intentional on on a lot of levels, and I think that this picture really captures how she was, I think, able to do two things. One, balance the, 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 the house with the garden so well, but the scale of being able to shape a space. Uh, there was no one better that could sort of figure out how high does a table have to be? How low does the table have to be? Where, where does that need to be in the context of the um, surrounding um, gardens? And again, just this is an example of that, I think. This is in the lower terrace at the Oak Spring Garden. Uh, this is very fairy tale, uh, right out of France to me. Uh, there's the wishing well, and with the, the vegetables, the cabbages uh, growing nearby. Uh, straight behind is the basket house, and to the right is a little schoolhouse. Uh, uh, when I said that she and Givenchy were uh, had an extreme. Uh, desire to adhere to their national uh, themes of gardening. You can see that in her, her garden with the schoolhouse is very much like what George Washington had at Mount Vernon. Here, this is the center path going down through the garden, beside, uh, the Oak Spring Garden and the lavender. That is the border plant that just flows over. So you can imagine what that smelled like when you walked down there <laughs> as you wrestled your skirts against there. <laughs> Here sorry she to, is. I'm, I'm sorry to jump in, but uh, we just got a question from someone who was interested what kind of plant it was. So if you just if you could just go maybe two slides back, and uh, Ellen Joy is asking if this mullen, M U W L. It is. It's a mullen. Cool. Thank you. Yes, and they they popped up all over the garden, even up on top of the walls, the stone walls. They would be like sentries up on top the wall and she just let them go front door. And, and by the front door by yeah door. <laughs> yeah and here she is looking at her topiary collection you can see the santalinas and the myrtle yes i think everyone knows her very much very uh for her topiary collection that was her i think signature um, part so her winter garden. Her this hardy, is her, her hardy <laughs> orange. Well, that's just where if you'd go to that 
kind of make-believe kitchen of hers. I don't know the Sunday kitchen, whatever. When she decided she was going to learn to cook, decided she didn't like cooking as much as she liked gardening. She took me in there and it was in the winter and you'd uh, look out at that and she said, I love this for the birds. And you would just look up and it offered protection because of the thorns and different things. And so the birds would just be having a field day, very much like um, kind of a Walt Disney kind of feel when you would look with her and the birds are magically going to one of her favorite trees. It was uh, very uh, magical to be there and see that. The gardeners told me that their number one top duty was to make sure all the bird feeders were filled tip top all the time. So now we're uh, switching inside one of her structures. I think we included this because I think it's just a great story and an idea that um, my grandmother over the years collected 11 Mark Brothkos. This is inside her library. This is one of the largest pieces of uh, Mark Rothko's collection. She bought it in a studio in New York with Givenchy in the early 1970s. Um, again, um, she was captured in a large part by the early contemporary artists uh, at the time. And um, ironically, uh, and thankfully, um, her, her husband, Paul, and everyone around her thought she was crazy for, for for purchasing these these Rothkos, and inevitably these Rothkos are what ended up, um, you know, anchoring um, a lot of her style. So um, it it really reflects something that I think, and I wish I could sort of give you perspective of how big this picture is. Um, Thirty feet long. Yeah, you know, Fifteen. But, um, there is only there is a huge doorway just to the left of this picture. It's a huge sliding door that's uh, ceiling to floor. And it would be the only way to get this in and out. And um, when she passed away, sadly, we had to um, move it um, and to just have that experience of watching these uh, poor people try and pick up a very expensive piece of artwork and get it in and out of that spot was very uh, interesting nonetheless. But I think, again, she was an innovator with her uh, gardens, but I think in a large part, her colors from the garden influenced her in her collection as well on some of the interiors. So, and I didn't know if you guys wanted to add any other parts to it, so. I do know the story about when that wall, that that wall that the, the Rothko is hanging on was one of the first walls that went up in this, when the library was being built and it was about halfway built. And then she came out, you know, she's had that eye, even though she measured everything and she looked and she said, hey, that wall needs to be a, a foot wider that and so he had to tear it all down and start over again and pull the wall out another foot and then start over <laughs> makes all the difference mm -hmm. this is at cape cod you want to talk about that describe that thomas sure yeah and again um i'm not sure how we're doing on time but i assume we're, we're doing okay here this is the driveway into her house in cape cod massachusetts um, she bought this with Paul in the 1950s, and many of these trees were brought in and over the last 50 or so years have uh, really changed um, and grown, but she developed such a, a wonderful collection of uh, English oaks. Um, you see some, um, and again, the, 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 the driveway, I think, anchors a lot of her style as well. It's just pea stone gravel that she would have very much as a standard uh, for most of her entryways for her driveways. Um, again, this is, I believe, in the garden um, at the Cape. Uh, she loved having sundials, a variety of elements uh, that would sort of, again, hold in the, the, the borderlines of the structure of the garden itself. And um, it really, I think, spoke to her whimsical nature as well. So um, here we have uh, the Cape, which is obviously in winter. Um, I think in a large part, it's it's nice to see these trees when, when they have their true shape. And um, I think over the years, um, really you can begin to see a lot of these, um, but you get a perspective when you look at this picture of the garden itself in Cape Cod, um, it's obviously gonna look much different in the winter. But again, you have this element here anchoring it. A lot of her pathways were all grass that were hedged by hand 
And typically you would have 10 to 12 gardeners a day working on a space like this. So um, it, it, was, it was one of those feats that she generally enjoyed, but it was very, very intense. We had a lot of people working for her regularly. Um, and I'll just draw attention to this man, Bobby Childs, who still works for us in the family. He has been working for us for 50 years. Started working, my grandmother trained him to trim trees and he and his son still trim the same trees that they started back 50 years ago. And he'll get up into these ladders that are in some cases 50 feet to 70 feet in the air and hand trim with these shears the leaves. And he has shaped honey locusts, a number of different trees that just are beautiful. And again, it speaks to the volume of loyalty that my grandmother had with both her set of employees all over the world um, and the amount of respect they had for her. So, um, Linda, do you want to share the story about this? Oh, the wooden trees. I love this story. She was really good at solving problems. She didn't turn away. And one problem that she solved was here in Nantucket and out on the Sconset shore of the Atlantic. It, uh, it's wind, you know, wind blown and it's hard to get trees. You can see there aren't any trees in the landscape, but because trees were very important to her, she wanted to have hawthorn trees planted around the property. And so they tried and tried, but it didn't work. So she resorted to her wooden trees and the wooden trees she created uh, and would install in this spot when she was considering planting a tree there. And they would uh, stake it out like a tent to, and then she would watch it sometimes for a year. Um, what she was watching for was the movement of the seasons and the change of the light and the shadows. And she wanted to see how they, it, they fell into the, gr the grounds and against the house. And so I recently learned that they would always uh, set up the tree, the wooden trees right before she came. And then when she left, they would put them back in the garage. <laughs> and this adding the view, into the elements the of, of the, yeah, of the shadows, just this picture, I think gives a sense of the land landscape in Nantucket and really how completely almost like a Scottish tundra. It was, it was uh, devoid of, of much of the vegetation that she was used to with the trees. And so she, again, adapted to the space that she allowed. So she didn't have to recreate. Here's, a, again, a sort of a, a, a view of those wooden trees. Um, and again, she, again, took, took a different view of how to, you know, anchor this garden space, which instead of having hedges, um, you know, again, would, would use this very, very sort of unique way of, of sanding down and painting um, clabbered wood and shingles. Did Natasha, Natasha have uh, a question? No, but here we, I, this is probably one of the last, but this is so yeah. important. Oh, do you want me to talk? Well, yes. well you were okay. there, but I mean, this is the, the Rose Garden. This is um, Mrs. Mellon's designer, the Rose Garden at the White House. And this is where I first came to know Mrs. Mellon through Mr. Williams, her gardener that she brought there in the 60s. And when I came to work there 20 years later, I was very fortunate to meet him and uh, learn about how he and Mrs. Mellon had created this garden. And it is uh, has French atmosphere, you can see very much so. Uh, the Lino the Lenote parterres and things like that. She, of course, looked to Andre Lenote for inspiration. Uh, the trees that were very important. Uh, President Kennedy uh, what asked her to do this garden, and he asked her to do it in the manner of Washington and Jefferson. And he wanted to plant from Jefferson. To France. I mean, th this was all inspired from their trip to France. From the Kennedy's trip to France. Well, the idea of having a garden, yes, he yes. got the idea when he was yeah, in Versailles. Charles de Gaulle made him very envious, actually, because de Gaulle just used those gardens at Versailles to magnificence. And uh, President Kennedy wanted the same thing. Um, but so he asked Mrs. Mellon to create an American garden, and he wanted plants that were Jeffersonian. They all really admired our President Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson did not plant flowers. Uh, he planted trees. And the uh, crabapple tree was one of his favorites. So Bunny included 
the crab apple trees as a nod to Thomas Jefferson. Uh, they're very Jeffersonian. And then the boxwood also is an old Virginia plant. And then the diamonds will, of course, diamonds are a girl's best friend. So <laughs> you can see the diamonds of Santa Lina in there and then flowers of the season. And then the lawn, he wanted a, a, a lawn because uh, this was an extension of his office. This was the idea. He was an outdoors kind of guy and he wanted everyone to be able to be outside. And this is Mr. and Mrs. Mellon there at Oak Spring saying, thanks for visiting. <laughs> <laughs> and, and just to throw in a little style point, my grandmother always wore a beret, always. always. <laughs> always, always. You would never see her out and about without her beret and her lovely, lovely jacket. But her beret and her, um, you know, gloves are just very much a signature part of, of who she was. So that's very French. <laughs> well, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this uh, fascinating walk through through the gardens and. Uh, Let's take some questions here now. Um, I'm interested myself, actually. I'm not sure if you have those, but let's see. So Dominique uh, Lalman is asking if you have any drawings of uh, Bunny Mellon. And I know that you also published a journal, right? Collect, uh, having collected some of your yes. notes, right? So maybe you can talk more about that and maybe show if you have any. Yeah, I'll get one. I have one. She was a prolific writer and also uh, doodler and would always if she wrote a letter to you it always included some beautiful flower or something with it that would have uh the petals would have a little message in it or something everything she did was great was with great thought and artistry can you see yeah yeah and quotes and things like that so back to the rose garden that you just uh, showed um, uh, linda jane uh we have a question which was actually the one I was thinking about while I was listening to you and discussion from Caroline Campbell, uh, she she wanted to know if the rose garden that you showed is the one that uh, uh, Melania Trump radically changed recently. Yes. The answer yes, it is. It is. Yes, it is. Again, Brian? These are the crab apple trees that she yes. she removed. That she removed. Yes. Is there is there a rationale behind the removal of the crab the crab apple tree was the, where they seek the reason uh, why she she changed that I don't think you know? so I don't I don't not that I don't think so no I think that they just Mrs Trump wanted to do something different <laughs> and so Caroline, the follow up question from that? Carolyn were the trees planted elsewhere I have no idea. I have no, I'm not involved with that at all. So I, I can't speak to that. Do you want to talk about Jacqueline Kennedy, you know, balancing on the other? Uh, okay, I would love to. Um, because involved. see, Mrs. when Mrs. Mellon was designing this garden, she uh, treated it as a uh, Southern style estate. And um, she wanted a symmetrical design so if you look at a picture of the White House, you'll see the Rose Garden on the west side and the east, or Jacqueline Kennedy Garden on the east side. And you'll, well, there used to be five crab apples on each side for a total of 10 in the Rose Garden. And then the same uh, design echoed across in the East Garden with hollies, holly trees. And there she used a fairy tale thing because uh, it was for uh, uh, Mrs. Kennedy and the children, an Alice in Wonderland theme, but the hollies anchored the crab apple. So you had this wholeness, integrated integration of design between the architecture and the gardens. So the gardens supported and enhanced the beauty of the architecture because of that relationship, that connectedness. And so when the crab apple trees were removed, you removed an essence, a sense of history because they were Jeffersonian and you removed also the, the integration of the design. Well, the interesting part that I want to add that I found through some of the <laughs> with uh, Bunny is with Lady Bird Johnson, she established a Jacqueline Kennedy garden. It was kind of wedged into that highway bill and so the, the East Garden is protected. So 
under a federal kind of thing. So it could not really be tampered with. And then the Rose Garden did not have such protection. So. I thought it, I always thought it did, but apparently it didn't. Well, I mean, I'm saying it didn't because it was changed with the house. <laughs> it wasn't, right? Clearly Never. it didn't. Yeah. Uh, a question maybe Thomas, can you answer that one? Uh, uh, how many garden staff are employed there at any given time? Do you have that information? Or because you met, you talked about the, the gardeners and uh... uh at 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 its height, my grandmother had over five hundred employees. Oh. If she had at one property, um garden staff at times were up to about thirty or forty per season. Uh, that included obviously people like Bobby Childs. But it also included, uh, you know, a variety of people that would work directly on the uh, garden spaces themselves. Um, but everything was done manually. Um, we have since upgraded in using uh, uh, electronic irrigation systems. And that was another thing too that I think my grandmother was was very much a. I believe in this day and age, if she was starting over, she probably would adapt a lot of the new modern technologies that allow for upgrades, but in those days, uh, there were probably, I would say at the Cape alone, 50 employees full-time every day working. Wow. We have, wow. Uh, we have two, two questions I, about the same in the chat and, and one also in, in the Q&A. I'll let you go, uh, go ahead with the one in the Q&A, Natasha, and I'll pick up on the one in the chat. Oh, right. So let's regroup these two questions. Uh, so people are interested if uh, her house and gardens are actually open to the public. If you can visit them, no. Um, so no, no. The, her her house in Oak Spring in Upperville, Virginia, is uh, a private foundation, the Oak Spring Garden Foundation. They do allow invitations, but it's usually through groups and through academic, um, you know, auspices. So uh, it's an invitation, uh, and it's certainly one of those, um, you know, again, um, it's not an open to the public type of situation. It will be open this spring with the Garden Club of Virginia Garden Day. Um, I don't have that exact date. You can find that online. Garden Club of Virginia uh, Garden Week. So okay. if I understood you well, you mean that it's not, not individuals, but a gr group can go, but they have to belong, I guess, to some garden society because there was a question like that in the, in the, in the chat. You yeah, you couldn't otherwise, it, it wouldn't be like going to the Washington Monument where you just get up a random Saturday and just show up at the front door. They're not going <laughs> to. Right. And what shape are the gardens in now? What shape are the gardens in? Yeah. That's um, the, the well, uh, again, it, it depends on each property. She had, you know, properties all over the world. The Oak Spring Garden um, is, is, is in a position where they are adapting and changing certain elements of it. Other elements have been protected. Um, you know, one of my favorite garden spaces, um, you know, was, was in our house down in Antigua. That's been restored um, and owned by a private uh, person at this stage. So, I, you know, again, to me, um, it, if you're looking at the main area that most people would see, it would be Oak Spring. Um, some elements have changed, but the majority of, of the of the structures themselves are the same. Uh, so we have um, we have another question here from uh, Corinne. Uh, did Bobby Charles really become a family friend, more than just a trusted longtime family employee? Uh, she's not sure if she's spelling the last name correctly, um, but no, that's um, correct. Okay. Yeah, no, so Bobby and his son, Aaron, um, absolutely, we know them very well. Um, my grandmother, as long as she had those relationships and she was very friendly, there was always, I think, a divide of, of, of a respectable sort of professional courtesy. So there was never a situation where I think Bobby came over for dinner, if that's sort of the impl implication. But um, I can tell you this, there, there is not a single person that has worked as long as he has that, and again, the average tenure for my grandmother uh, was about 30 years for all of her employees across uh, uh, all of all, all groups. And every single one of them um, was forever loyal to her. Uh, she treated them with the utmost respect, care, uh, especially people like Bobby Child. She leaned on them for their own ideas and suggestions. And she would take those suggestions. She would not just unilaterally order people around. 
she would listen and she was a true leader in that respect. So someone like Bobby Childs, who I still talk to, um, he's a treasure because he has so many stories. Uh, and those are the things that I love the most uh, are the stories that, again, are only there because these people knew my grandmother so well um, and for so long. Another question from Caroline. Is the blue pattern fabric behind Thomas an homage to Bunny? I think she thinks she can see shapes <laughs> of branches and a special blue. It's a, it's a beautiful blue behind Definitely. Me. I agree with you. Um, it, it is, it does have that, 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 that bunny blue uh, fabric to it. I truthfully, it's not intentional. I love it. I think it's pretty nice. Um, <laughs> but it has no, no attachment no, directly no. to my grandmother other than she loved her blue. You're right. And also, I just would like to read out a comment from uh, Ellen Doy, who says, this is making me so happy. Can't wait for the book to arrive and for spring to arrive, too. I'm still in the garden, but the winter weather is really taking over. Ellen from Baltimore. I don't know if you know her. Uh, so I was uh, mostly amazed at her ability to, Bunny Mellon's ability to find this perfect balance between uh, making a place look, you know, natural and authentic, and at the same time, not sort of having it fall into some abandoned, disregarded place, right? And especially the slides, slides, I think, number 18 or 20, or uh, I forgot with the cracks, right? They were just wonderful. And I wonder if, if, if it's something, I'm totally like, you know, illiterate in terms of horticulture. So I'm wondering if it's something she brought into or she learned it from something? And what were the countries she was most inspired by? France. <laughs> she was definitely inspired by France and, and also by old Virginia. Her father had grown up in old Virginia outside Charlottesville with Nancy Astor, Nancy Lancaster. And it was this after the Civil War era and um, you know, they people just made do and it was a soft, gentle culture. And so they didn't have lots of help. And so thing, the plants did roam and uh, it was soft and lovely. And so she, her father grew up in that. She worked alongside her father on several different projects. And I would say that she learned a lot of that uh, from, from him and from that exposure to it. Maybe talk about Antoine a minute, Antoine Jacobson and talking about Bunny, in some way being the Marie Antoinette without some of the uh, the necessary things of frivolousness or whatever of how Bunny really did, thinking to the Hameau at Versailles or something where Marie Antoinette would have the wormholes and things into something so it would not look gilded and gold like the palace and it'd be a little more uh, rustic simplicity, but at great, great uh, expense to look unkempt, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Lynn. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I'll just add, no, I can't, um, that when Antoine came to Oak Spring, he said, oh, Marie, he called her Marie, Marie Antoinette would be very at home here. He said, I expect to see her come out from around the corner any moment now. This looks like a garden that she made. And then it will tell, and then he's the head of the protege at he, Versailles. So, at the protege at, yeah, Versailles. Yeah, yes. We, we had Antoine, yeah. uh, thanks to uh, with Linda, actually, we had, a, we had Antoine at the Alliance Francaise a couple of years ago where I presented the Potager du Roi. Yes. It was a fabulous event. I, I then went to Versailles just to visit the Potager du Roi myself oh. a, a year or so. We have a, a, a comment on, by Dominique. Uh, um, uh, she likes the picture of the path with the grass in the middle. This is a very environmental concept. It has been used in Nantes, France, to grow grasses on the pathway of the tramway. Uh, she thinks that Bunny Mellon was a visionary with, and it was such an enjoyable talk. Thank you. She's correct. <laughs> she was a visionary. <laughs> yes. True. Thank you very much for that compliment. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, I'm uh, the executive director. For those of you uh, who wonder who is that person uh, intervening at the end of the of the event, uh, so I um, I hope you have a, a great weekend for everybody. This and I hope you will uh, come back for the chat with Nicholas Elliott if you love the cinema. 
And of, if not, we will see you again in January. And thank you so much, Thomas, uh, Brian, and Linda Jane. It was it was a pleasure to see you again. Uh, thank you. For thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. And thank you to everyone out there. Thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to share this story and this book and this experience with all of you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.